ready, man. Good morning. Are ready? Well, good morning, church. I'd have you all stand, but it's just us here. You can stand if you want to, but just prepare your heart, prepare your mind to worship the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. Lord, hear our cry. Come heal our land. Breathe life into these dry, thirsty souls. Lord, hear our prayer, forgive our sin, as we call on your name, would you make this place for your glory to dwell, open the blind eyes, unlock the dead to your people as we draw near hear us from heaven touch our generation we are your people crying out in desperation Lord hear our song Your children worship As we sing out your praise Would you make this a place For your glory to dwell Open the blind eyes Unlock the deaf ears Come to your people As we draw near Hear us from heaven, touch our generation. We are your people, crying out in desperation. Hear us from heaven, hear us from heaven, hear us from heaven, heal our from heaven, hear us from heaven, hear us from heaven, heal our land. Open the blind eyes, unlock the deaf ears, come to your people as we draw near. Hear us from heaven, touch our generation. We are your people, crying out in desperation. Open the blind eyes, unlock the deaf ears. Come to your people as we draw near. Hear us from heaven, touch our generation. We are your gather this morning under one name, the name of Jesus. I pray that you would hear our cry. God, that you would hear our praise. You would hear our worship. God, and heal our hearts. Heal this land. God, because we know with you we have hope. It's by the blood of Jesus our sins are washed away and we're cleansed, God. So we thank you and we praise you. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like me. Sun come 
lies before me Let me be seen when the evening comes Bless the Lord, oh my soul Of the world by darkness. 
to save us, Lord. We consider you and the price you paid to save us, Lord. You save us, Lord. We can we consider you and the life you gave to save us, Lord. Save us, Lord. Here is my heart. Here is my soul. And all my brokenness. And everything I hold. You have called me yours, oh God. And I will not grow weary. Lose the heart you give me. soul and all my brokenness and everything I hold you have called me yours oh God and I will not grow weary lose the heart you give me consider Jesus Consider Jesus. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, God. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes. your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and i
foundation and I will put my trust in you alone. and I will not be shaken and I will build my life upon your word it is safe foundation Thank you for the life that we have in you. God, I was thinking of the song, Who Am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my pain, would care to feel my hurt. But that's the God that you are. And that's the God that we serve. God, who's above all pain, who's above all sin, the God who saves. And Lord, I pray that just as this song sings, we would look to you. Not to the things of this world, God. Not to the things that our heart might want that are separate from you. God, I pray that our hearts would desire you. Desire what you would have for us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Yes, thank you, Lord. Well, good morning. Oh, man, I just, the words of that prayer ringing in my heart that we would desire, we would want you, Lord, and let all the things of this world <laughs> fade away. Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, it's good to be here with you guys. Uh, our first thing I wanted to do is say Happy Mother's Day. There's not a woman in the house this morning, but we want to thank you, mothers, because without you, mothers, there would be no one in the house, and that's for sure. So we want to thank you guys. We want to thank God for you. We, we want to pray this morning that you're blessed. And my prayer is that you get to maybe take it easy and do something you want to do today. And, and uh, we just thank God for you. We, we are blessed to have you in our lives. We're blessed to have the mothers, all the mothers, whether you're, uh, you know, I'm sure you're a mother, you can still be a daughter of someone and be a mother, whether you're the wife of someone and you're a mother, we just thank you for those moms, all of them, thank you Lord, so we pray that you're blessed today, um, I believe, now I heard this in passing, I believe Mary said something about we do have some Mother's Day things for the mothers, so if you want to stop by next week and pick up uh, whatever it is, I don't even know, usually it's like a coffee cup or a pen or something little bookmark. I'm not sure what it is, but Mary said she got some for us, so um, you mothers can come by and pick one of those up. Um, but it's good to be here with you this morning. The way that we can, it's not normal. It's not the normal Mother's Day thing that we're doing, 
We don't get to see you and hand out a flower and all those things. I wish you guys were here. Um, But it looks like, with all that said, we are going to be reopening the doors very soon. So a little too soon for some of us. We're trying to put some projects back together and get things ready. But we're looking at next Sunday, the 17th, um, opening the doors and gathering back together. Hopefully, you're rejoicing with us this morning going, yes, Lord. I, I mean, we, we've, been, we've been doing uh, the best we can, I think, to, to get the word out still, even though we're not gathering together. But, I mean, it is, there's nothing like gathering together and, you know, worshiping corporately together with one another and just allowing that awesome time, the Holy Spirit moving and working in our midst. And we're, I'm just, I'm really looking forward to it. So a couple of things though, this is going to be kind of a, a little bit of a soft boot. We're going to do uh, just one service at 1030. Um, and we're not, we're, we're not sure at this point. I think we're looking to try to get childcare or something so that the kids can still go have a church uh, kind of thing going on, but either way, I'm just going to tell you this, you know, I don't know if Charlotte or Mary listening are going, no, or what, but hold on to your horses. E- either way, um, I would say bring your family, bring your kids, and if, you know, if the children's, if the children's church isn't open, which I'm assuming we will have at least somebody to help back there with some child care and say, you know, talk to your kids about Jesus and all those things that we desperately miss. Uh, um, But even if we don't have something like that, still come. Still bring your kids. Still come to church. Hang out with us. Um, And if you're thinking you wouldn't be comfortable at service, or if you're thinking my kids are too loud at service, whatever, we are going to try to, you know, accommodate that stuff on the the patio and in the kitchen. So I, I would say just come and see these people see the body of Christ, fellowship, get together with one another as we rejoice and get to worship. Now listen, if you're not comfortable coming to church yet, we understand. We totally understand. Live streaming will continue. YouTube will continue. Um, If you show up uh, uh, next Sunday at 1030 and you look in the doors and I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't know if people are going to not want to come. I think everyone's going to want to come. But if you look through those back doors in the sanctuary and you go, there's too many people, well, then uh, I would say go out, try to find a spot. Where I think this is an idea I haven't, pa- I haven't passed by anybody yet, but I think we might block off some of those first parking spots so that we could have some more separate seating uh, if you guys want to, you know, distance yourselves even more. Um, but I'm just excited to see you guys. I'm excited to be together. I'm excited to worship with you. Um, so, man, we're looking forward to services opening. I know it's it's kind of interesting because, like, you know, we didn't contact any of the other Calvaries or other churches, but I've been seeing Calvary after Calvary that is opening next Sunday. So it's kind of a neat thing um, that we're able to do that, um, that we've kind of got the okay, the go-ahead for uh, from the from the government, and just so you guys know and can be at ease, you know, we're not trying to demand our doors be open, but we did get a letter from the attorney general, um, and they said we're okay to be open. They deemed churches as an essential uh, thing, and they've given us basically the responsibility of trying to be safe the best we can. So um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to open up. And we're going to ask you guys once again, though, to remember one another, to think of each other, uh, not only in prayer, but just to practice love. So if you're not sick, or you're not feeling good, or you are at risk and you don't want to come, do not come. Especially if you're sick, though. (laughs) Please just stay home, get better, come back when you're feeling good, right? Um, and, And also, continue to pray for us that we would be able to have wisdom in these weird times. But with all that said, get your Bible out. Turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23. All this stuff on our hearts, on our minds, and rolling around our heads. Let's get into the Word of God and listen to what He has to say to us. Amen. So, chapter 23 of the Gospel of Matthew. And where we're picking up, we're still on the Temple Mount. We're still in the scene. 
We're still in the last days of Jesus' life. He's just got done. If you remember um, from last week, the last time we looked at what was happening, they're kind of up in that courtyard and the, in the court of the Gentiles at the temple, and there's teachings that are going on, um, and Jesus has been sharing a whole lot. But last week, the religious rulers that be, the powers that be, they, they came and tried to really stumble, stump, trap Jesus in his words. And we saw him respond in just amazing ways. I, I mean, I, they, were, they were trying to guide him down one direction, and his answer was so far outside the box, but so full of truth. Everyone was going, whoa. In fact, they left off. If you guys remember, um, the, in verse 46, they left off that day. It, it says right there, from that day on, uh, no one dared question him anymore. So as Jesus is responding to these guys, he's really, in a sense, shutting them down. I mean, he's not trying to shut them down, but they're, they're shutting themselves down as they're trying to trip him up, and then he answers with such solid truth, they're going like, what do we say? And I look at that, and I think to myself, you need to say, Jesus, I've been mistaken, and I want you and need you in my life. That's what we say. We say, my pride, I'm wrong, and I want you in my life. But Jesus, at the very end of that scene, he asked them a question, and he, and he asked them about who he was, who the Messiah would be. If you guys remember, they said the son of David, and Jesus revealed that David himself called the Messiah the Lord, called him God. And so Jesus reveals that, and that's what really shut him down. And they couldn't say anymore. So this is still the scene. This is where we're at. He's still on the temple. It's still busy. There's still Passover coming. Things are happening all over the place. And he's going to continue now to address the religious rulers, but he's not going to address them the way he was before. He's not going to speak directly to them, answering their questions, correcting them. He's now going to turn and speak to his disciples and to the multitudes that are still around there with him. But what he's going to do in, in addressing the people around him is he's going to address the Pharisees still. He's going to really warn the people about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious rulers, the scribes. He's going to warn them about these people and the different uh, pitfalls, the different destructive things that are in their life. And kind of, in a sense, warn us about things that can happen as we live this life and become, you know, religious. And I, and I talked to this a few weeks ago and, and kind of spoke about it in, in my life. And I, I want to make sure that we, because there's a danger of us going, oh, those Pharisees are gross, but, but not looking at those things to the, to the degrees that they are in our lives. Because, you know, the, the Pharisees, they were to a very large degree, they were hypocrites. In our lives, it might not be to that degree, but there are still some things in our lives that God wants to address. So, so keep, let's keep our, our Holy Spirit antennas up, so to speak. Let's keep our, our hearts open to those things that God wants to crack open our heart and reveal to us and go, uh, I'll tell you one thing. This scripture, it reminds me that our hearts are deceitfully wicked, they're desperately wicked, and, and who can know them but God? I mean, these guys think they're righteous, and God's going to reveal their heart, at least to us. I don't know if they're going to receive it, but he's going to reveal their heart, and it reminds me that we can think we're good, we can think we're righteous, but we're fooling ourselves. So, anyways, with all that said, Jesus is going to correct, or I'm sorry, warn the people and his disciples about these Pharisees, and I have to just mention something. I just kind of skipped over it, but I'm backing up. I wanted to mention this. He doesn't pull everyone aside and talk about the Pharisees in private, kind of behind their back. He does all of it wide open in front of everyone. And, and you know, all that to say, really, why? Why did he do it in front of everyone? Was it to disgrace and humiliate them? No, it was to reveal the truth. It was to reveal the truth, and, and to who? It was to reveal the truth to the disciples around him and to the Pharisees, not to humiliate, but because of love. 
You know, love shares the truth. Love reveals the truth. And so when we're way out there, man, thank God for someone who will come and share us, share with us the truth of our own selves, of our own hearts. So just keep that in mind as we go through the text today. So let's start. Let's check it out. Chapter 23, verse 1. And it says, And when Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So, interesting. A few things. Right off the bat here, Jesus acknowledges the Pharisees and the scribes. He acknowledges that they do sit in the seat of Moses. Now, I mean, it's kind of like a a little bit debated among commentaries of whether they took that seat unrightfully, but I mean, this is who they were. They were the religious rulers of that time. They're sitting in the seat of Moses. What does that mean? Well, number one, the seat means that they were in a position of teaching. So when somebody would, a rabbi would teach, they would sit and the people around them would stand. So it means, number one, that they're in the authority of teaching the people. And number two, Moses represents what? You guys know? He represents the law. So he, he, the seat of Moses represents the teaching and it represents the law of the word of God. Um, so Jesus says, in regards to the teaching of the Pharisees, of these religious rulers, the scribes, in regards to what they're saying, listen to it. Listen to the word. Listen to what they're doing and do according to what they're doing. But then he goes on to say, but don't do what they do. Ah, so, (laughs) you know, you kind of hear that old, you you, you probably think of that old thought, right? That's that's don't do what I uh, do, or do what I say, not what I do, right? Do what I say, not what I do. Jesus is saying, look, do what they say, don't do what they do. That doesn't mean that it's okay to say that. That means these people were messing up, right? It means the Pharisees, the religious rulers, they were messing up. They were saying, I mean, they weren't practicing what they preach, I don't know if you've used that before, practice what you preach. But when you, when you become somebody who shares the word and somebody says that, it's like a whole other thing in your mind. You're going like, I want to do that. And you can see your own life and go, I fail in so many areas of that. But I want to do that. I want to practice what I preach. And this is what Jesus is saying. Don't be like them. Do the things that the word is telling you to do. They're not lining up their lives with the word, but you do. Practice what you preach. Practice what you know. Practice what the word says. And then according to Jesus, the other thing that they do here in the text is they they give heavy, burdensome teachings, hard, heavy things that weigh people down, that guilt people, that burden people, but they themselves are not willing to to do them. So they're burdening people with the word. They're they're heaping heavy things upon them, things that they won't do, which is really the opposite of Jesus. Do you guys remember Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, in verse 28, what Jesus says? He says, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, I mean, which is Work with the work that I'm giving you. Take my burden. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. (laughs) When you compare those two side by side, it's it's a no-brainer. Which one do you want to follow? You want to follow some teacher that doesn't practice what they preach and they lay heavy trips on you and, you know, what, I don't know why, but one of the things that pops into my head is like kind of like the TV, you know, preacher evangelist guys that are like, you know, 
all about send your money, send your money, send your money. And I think, what about you? I remember Chuck Smith saying, if those guys really believed what they said, they would be sending you their money because they know God's going to bless them instead of standing up there asking for money. And I think to myself, man, it's a burden that they want to put on people, but they're not willing to bear. And so that's what Jesus is calling these Pharisees, these hypocrites. He's calling it out. But look at, man, we could just spend the rest of the morning looking at Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30, because it's so good. I mean, I'm not going to do it, but it's just so good. Jesus, he's the one you want to learn from. He's the one we want to follow. He's the one we want to you know, not learn from at a distance, not just hear his words, but to yoke up to, but to, to be joined alongside in the work. He's like, I'll help you through the work, not like the Pharisees sitting in their seats, putting burdens on people saying, come with me, join me in this way of life, in this walk. And when you take my yoke upon me, number one, learn from me, But number two, he says, his nature, I'm lowly of heart. I'm gentle. Man, it's awesome to to learn from somebody who's that way, you know, and not going, what's the matter with you? Why can't you get this? I told you 15 times. Jesus is like, no, come on, let's go together. He's gentle. He's lowly. He helps us in this walk of life. And he says, and when you come with me, you will find rest for your soul. Of course, The Pharisees weren't giving people rest. They were heaping burdens that were unattainable upon them. They were taking the law and adding so much to it. Of course, you know, we see that the biggest with uh, the Sabbath day, right? All the little things they said, you know, you got to take your dentures out because you're carrying a load, a burden. You can't have a false leg. You can't, all of these things, you can't turn the light switch on. All these little rules that they did in order to be holy, righteous, that weren't even a part of the law. Jesus says, you come with me, you're going to find rest for your soul. I don't know about you, I could use some rest for my soul. Jesus, will you, will you let us come with you? Let's attach to him, let's follow him. His yoke is easy, his burden is light. Now, I spent way too long talking about that. So Jesus moves on from, from these heavy things that they won't do to now it's, it, it, he kind of moves the idea to the why. Why they do the things that they do do. I don't know if you can say do do in church, but I just did. Why they do the things that they do do, okay? Verse 5. <laughs> Sorry. You're not in church, so it's okay. You're, you're just watching from home. Forgive me on that. Verse 5. But all their works they do to be what? Seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues. They love greetings in the marketplace and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, For one is your Father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Man, so Jesus goes into this section full of all kinds of awesome stuff. um, But really, really calling out these guys Um, at some of the things that they're doing in order to be seen by men and the things that they love, which is recognition from men. So let's take a look at this. In verse 5, he starts out revealing to them that their heart is far from God, but their works they do for that recognition, for that praise and honor of men. And he starts out by saying they make their phylacteries broad and they enlarge the borders of their garments. So, what's a phylactery? I don't know. Have you ever heard of a phylactery worker? I'm just kidding. That's a factory worker. Different thing. 
phylacteries are these, I don't know if you guys have seen them before, but they're these little boxes that the Orthodox Jews will still wear, but they'll, they're little boxes like this, and they have scriptures in them, and they'll actually strap them to their forehead. I remember the first time I saw those, the, the way that they're shaped is weird. They have like a flat plate, and then the box is a little bit smaller on top of the flat plate. I can't, I don't have a picture or anything. But when I saw it, I thought it kind of looks like a top hat, <laughs> but micro size, you know, like, what is their, their top hats are horrible. But anyways, th- they got these little boxes with the scriptures, so they bind them to their heads. You know, it comes from, the, from an Old Testament thought of binding the word to your, to your heart, of putting it between the frontlets of your eyes. It's, it means to keep it on your mind, to keep it on your heart. Well, they actually literally put the scripture on their head, and then they'll sometimes put it on their arm right here with the leather strap and rant, wrap it all around themselves. If you've been to Israel, you might have seen some of those guys, or either Israel or New York, Brooklyn, wherever, you'll see some of these guys. Um, but this is what they do. They bind these on here, and, the, and then the, the, our, the borders of their, enlarging the borders of their garments. Really, that goes back to uh, an Old Testament Levitical thought as well, that the Levitical uh, guys with their robes, they'd put these borders of blue ribbon on the garments of their, uh, of their robes in order f- for that, when they saw these blue ribbons, it would remind them of heaven. So it's one of those reminders that every time you'd see them, you'd, you'd get your mind set back on what you're living for, what you're wearing these clothes for, what you're getting up in the morning to do every day. And so they had these, uh, these couple of things that they were supposed to do. And so Jesus says, you guys, he basically calls them out. You're, you've begun to make this like into some sort of competition. Who can have the biggest border on your garment? Or who can have the biggest box of scripture on your head? And it's an outward thing. It has nothing to do with your real righteousness or spirituality. It's just to be seen like, whoa, dude, man, that guy's carrying the whole book on his head. Like it's going to make you into something that's more pure, or more holy. And so here they are doing this stuff, doing this spiritual stuff, these spiritual dance. I don't know. In my mind, it's like spiritual peacocking. They're just, they got their feathers out, you know, and they're walking around like, ooh, wow, look at that. But there's not a whole lot there. It's just feathers, it's just fluff. You ever seen a turkey strutting? There's not, they're not as big as they look when they're doing that. They're a lot smaller than that, but it's all look. It's all for show. Then in verses 6 and 7 of this section, Jesus goes on to reveal that they love the best seats, the places of honor. And again, what is that? It's really recognition. They love the position that, that comes with their title of being a, of a, a leader, a God, you know, leader of God, a, 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 a scribe. They love that people would greet them in public and say, Rabbi, Rabbi. And Jesus turns this on its head and says, you and I, us, kind of to the common people that he's speaking to, we don't do this. And he says something that's amazing and profound that I believe a lot of, and I'm going to put an emphasis on the word us because I'm one. A lot of us pastors and church leaders need to hear. And he says there's one teacher. It's the Christ. I mean, he's revealing it. He's calling it like it is. There's one that's above all of us. There's one that's the head of the church. And it's not you, Pharisees. It's Jesus. It's the Messiah. There's one that teaches. There's one that we need to hear and have our hearts fixed on his words, and it's Jesus. And then he says to to all of them standing there, you guys, you're all brothers and sisters. You're all the family. We're all together. He really levels the playing field in the body of Christ by saying, look, you're all, we're all brothers and sisters. And you guys probably, if you know me at all, you probably know this is coming because it's, it's what I love. And it's whenever I get to go share music or, or share somewhere, I love to be able to share my title with people. And of course, I remember sharing at this one concert. And I said, I just, before we start, I want to share my title with you. And the guy that invited me was like, he looked at me like, oh no, what's he going to say? And of course, it's my mamaw, my great grandma's saying in her testimony recorded at the old First Baptist Church in Winslow, my title is, 
I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And that is the truth. That is the truth of the matter. I'm a sinner who think God was called by an amazing Savior and washed white and made clean. And I'm so thankful for that. That's who I am, right? I'm loved by him, and that's who I am. That's what makes me what I am. And anything that I get to do in this life to serve him, anything that I am in this life, I am by the grace of God. Not because of me, but really in spite of me. And it's the truth for all of us. This is who we are. This is who we are. We're sinners saved by grace. So then he moves on, and, and, he, and he gives us more. I want to look at these a little bit more. It says, you're all brethren. Verse 9, he says, so do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Now, I think it's funny. I, I kind of, I, I don't know. There's a part of me that, I mean, he's teaching us. He's giving us love. There's a part of me that says, I wish he would have said, he who is greatest among you, be called the servant. Take the title out. I don't know if you've ever met anybody, Christian or not, that was in love with their title. But that happens in life. People get in love with their title, and it, with it, they comes this pride of who I am. It's what I am. It's who I am. And that's kind of what Jesus is addressing here. Now, I don't believe that Jesus is against there being leaders or um, overseers in the church. But what he's saying here, or what he's showing and revealing, is that these men, they want to have a title or a position above others, and that's what they're living for. That's what they're wanting. They're wanting a place over people. And I think Jesus is warning of this because he knows that titles do this to people. He knows the titles do this. He knows what, maybe it's not titles, he knows just what people's pride can do when a title is applied. And it's the same today. You know, uh, people, people refer to themselves in all these different things. Let me see. <clears throat> I think I have it in my notes. We'll see if I get to it. But... Um, People want to refer to themselves in, in, in all these different things. One commentary said he, he mentioned the title apostles. I don't know if you've ever mentioned if you've ever met anyone that came off saying, "Hey, I'm an apostle." But one one commentary said it was a, a teacher that I really love and respect. He said, "I don't know how somebody can refer to themselves as an apostle and not be affected by that, because it's coming off saying like I'm better than everybody, basically, right? I'm an apostle. Like I, I, you guys are just Christians. I'm an apostle." I'm a, I'm a director of this. I'm a leader of this. I'm somebody who's overseeing over all this. So I don't know. Um, and and the, uh, there's another one that I know Chuck Smith mentioned a lot, and, and I've heard quite a few times. In fact, I remember one time one of our children's ministries getting a letter in the mail, and it called that person the reverend. That word reverend. I don't know. People use the title reverend. You guys know what the word reverend means? I looked it up. I was like, okay, what does reverend really mean? I looked it up. Reverend means to stand in awe of. So when you're calling somebody a reverend, you're calling them somebody that you stand in awe of. I mean, I stand in awe of myself, but it's usually when I do something so dumb, I'm like, how in the world did I just do that? I cannot believe I did that. I stand in awe, but not in the way to revere somebody, to revere, to regard somebody so highly. Man, Jesus is the only one we should be standing in awe of, right? What he's done for us. We just get to be beneficiaries. We just get to partake in all that he has done. Then Jesus goes on. He gives us a few more names not to call us spiritually. He says, literally, and he's talking about spiritually, right? He's not talking about don't call your dad father. That's not good. Don't call your elementary school teacher teacher. No, he's not saying that. He's talking spiritually. He, he's saying, you know, don't call them rabbi, father, or teacher because that would put them above you. That would put them in a place above where you're at, and you're all brothers and sisters. Now, when I think about that, 
I mean, sometimes I refer to myself as teacher, and I'm, I'm not trying to refer to myself as teacher because a teacher comes off as like, I already know all this stuff, and I'm just teaching it to you guys. No, I'm a learner. Every time I get to dig in and study, I'm learning right alongside you guys. So I'm really not a teacher. I'm just a guy that likes to go through the Bible and study through it and share what I find, the nuggets here and there. I, and in no way, shape, or form am I over anyone. I'm just blessed to be able to do what I get to do. Thank God for the people that he calls. You know, pastor, the word pastor, it's a title, right? The word pastor really means shepherd. I like to call myself a lead sheep, and I'm just as sheepish as all the other rest of the sheep. I'm, I'm, I'm not above anyone. If anything, the title, the, the way I look at it doesn't give me like honor or it doesn't give me power. What it gives me is responsibility that I need to be diligent with that I need to, to love people and to continue to teach the word, rightly dividing his word. So anyways, a couple of words on that. But he says you have one father and your father is God. You have one teacher and it's Jesus. And so here we are this morning to be taught by him in his word. Amen. So, uh, but once again, at the end of this section, Jesus goes in and he once again reveals the path to greatness, which is not to gain a title or a position, but if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you need to be a servant. I'm so thankful that he reveals to us the truth. I'm so thankful that he gives us the way to be great to serve, to love, to be lowly, to be of no reputation, to be a brother or a sister, just somebody with loving heart, loving hands to serve. And he ends this section with one, or uh, yeah, no, he ends this section um, with what one commentary said, and I would agree, is a spiritual law. Verse 12, he says, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. I don't think I can add to that. I don't think I even want to comment on that. It's just the truth. It's a fact. Lord, help us to be humble. Help us to have a real assessment of ourselves. And then he moves into this next section, uh, which in which he proclaims, starting in verse 13, he proclaims eight woes to the scribes and the Pharisees. One interesting thing to do is to take these eight woes to the scribes and Pharisees and to line them up against the Beatitudes. Uh, and there's a few of them in here that I'll probably mention, but they really line up really well with uh, the Beatitudes. And, and it's just an interesting thing, kind of parallels each other. Because these, the Beatitudes show us how to be blessed. Blessed are you if you, and, and blessed are the, those who mourn. Blessed are the, and so we have these how to be blessed in this life. And then these woes show us really the opposite. How to be messed up in life. If you do these things, whoa, it's going to mess up. It's going to hurt you. So one so shows us to be blessed and the other one shows us to be a mess. So let's look at the first one, verse 13. He says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering in to go in. So the first woe that Jesus tells them is that they are shutting up the kingdom of heaven against men. Of course, he already mentioned the burdensome things that they're putting upon men that they can't even attain and that they don't even, you know, people can't attain and they don't lift a finger to do. But the meaning in this, to me, when I'm looking at this, I'm reading through, is that they're blocking people from going in. And them, as spiritual leaders, blocking people from entering heaven, it's like double uh-oh, double woe. That's not what spiritual leaders do. Spiritual leaders show people the door into heaven. Question really quickly, what's the door? Jesus is the door into heaven. And this is where their problem is. They're not showing people how to get in. Because I believe the most literal way that they're rejecting or stopping people from coming in is by rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. Now, th 
this is kind of up for debate. We're not sure if they didn't have a clue that Jesus was Messiah. Personally, I think, how could you think that? How could you see what he did? How could you hear what he said and not go, this guy is from God, unless they're just completely spiritually blinded? And they could be. I think some of them probably knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but they still did not acknowledge or allow people to go in. And that's why it says there, Jesus says, and you guys aren't going in yourselves. You're not accepting the door. You're not accepting the way to heaven, which is Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And they're not allowing people to go in, of course, because they want people to follow them and not to follow Jesus. And so the first beatitude in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus revealing how to get into heaven. You want to get into heaven? you got to come poor in spirit, not full of pride, not full of yourself, understanding. You come to God and say, God, I can't make it to heaven. I can't be good enough to keep that law. And that's where Jesus steps in and becomes our righteousness and becomes our, uh, our, our, you know, the punishment of our sin upon him. Okay, number two, verse 14. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. He goes on to call them hypocrites. And he's calling them throughout this. He's calling them a hypocrite in verse 13. He calls them again in verse 14. He's going to continue to call them hypocrite. Which, what is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is a pretender. It's an actor. It's actually really literally an actor who would wear, if you remember those masks. <laughs> I don't know why, but that when I was a kid, that was like, the people would always doodle those. Like, I don't know if it was gang things or something, or gang paraphernalia. Or whatever, but these people would always, kids would always doodle those on their notebooks and stuff. But it was the the happy mask and the sad mask, and so I'm sure it's just kind of whatever it is. But what it is in that day and age was, you put this mask on when you go out to act happy or you go out to act sad. So it's really literally putting on a mask, putting on something that you're not, in order to pretend that you're something else. And this is how Jesus defines them. And he says by saying that, or Jesus says, they devour and consume widows' houses. One commentary that I went through said that they would take and they would actually get widows to hand them over their house through kind of conniving ways in order to take the money for the Lord, but really were padding their pockets and I don't have a whole lot. Of, there's only one commentary that mentioned that, but I wouldn't put it past them because we do know for certain Jesus called them out twice on the issue of withholding money from their parents that they were supposed to use to help their parents who were getting elderly and saying, I'm going to take this money and keep it because you know why? I've given everything that I have to God, so now I, have to, I can't give you God's money, so I've got to keep this money, and I can't have you taking up the resources of God. And it wasn't honoring to God at all. Jesus exposed that. Then he goes on to say, making long prayers in order that people would be impressed. And at the very end of the section, he says something scary. He says, because of this, they would receive greater condemnation. Seemingly greater than the other people who are being condemned. I mean, Jesus kind of straight up says, and he's going to say it even more boldly at the end of this section, you guys are condemning yourselves. You will be condemned because of what you're doing. Counting them with the condemned. For being hypocrites and ripping people off in the name of God, and I would even say back it up to verse 13, for leading people astray, keeping them out of heaven. And then going back even further, a few chapters back, when Jesus pronounced a woe on those who would stumble little ones, little believers, 
And so here they are supposed to be leaders of the, uh, of the uh, you know, representations of God, leaders of the, the synagogues in that day and age, and here they are leading people away from the truth. And then the, the beatitude from chapter 5, the second one, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And when I read that, I think, well, that goes for those widows, you know, those people that are being wronged um, by these men. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Verse 15, number three, the third woe, verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, one convert. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. So here, here's these men who Jesus doesn't deny their zeal. They're zealous, but they're not zealous for a good thing. They're zealous in the wrong thing. They're really trying to build their own kingdom. They're going out to convert someone, and it says across the sea, right? So they go far away from Judaism to convert a Gentile, to pull them out of paganism, and they throw them into this burdensome religious system that really isn't honoring God, but honoring their rules and honoring their commands. And so, man, it's just crazy. And it says that they make them twice as bad as themselves. And this is, as I was studying through this, I just, I thought, this is just crazy. They're taking somebody from a different culture that doesn't know God. Doesn't know God the way that the Israelites who knew the old covenant, the old testament would. And then they corrupt them with legalism. They corrupt them with heavy burdens and piety, false reverence, and make them into even worse sons of the devil, sons of hell, as they are. Which, of course, that's a strong word. Jesus just called the religious rulers sons of hell. Scary. Number four, the, uh, verse 16, the number fourth woe. He says, woe to you blind guides who say, whoever swears by the temple is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for, with, for which is greater, the gold of the temple that, uh, I'm sorry, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swell, swears by the altar, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is obligated to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift that you're bringing to the altar, or the altar that sanctifies the gift. Therefore, verse 20, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. 21, he who swears by the temple swears by it and him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. So it's interesting. We, we see this... Uh, we see this little picture here. Jesus is really giving us a clue, a hint into something that they did that was offensive to God as religious rulers. And what they did was to make up their own little system of ways that they could swear an oath but not have to keep it because they didn't swear by the gold in the temple, just the temple. Oh, I, I would have done that. I would have came by and done your yard work like I promised you that I would, but I didn't swear by the by the seats in the church just the building itself i mean that's kind of like they're just trying to you, you know what it really reminds me of i don't know if you ever did this as a kid but w as a kid if you wanted to tell somebody something that wasn't honest or truthful you cross your fingers and put them behind your back and then you tell the lie you go oh yeah that was i'm gonna do that tomorrow and really you crossed your fingers so you have no intention of doing it at all and this is kind of what they were doing i these grown men, I mean, like, these are adults that are supposed to be honest, upright, representing God, are finding ways to not keep oaths. And Jesus is going, hey, like, what are you doing? Why do you think the gold in the temple is more precious? Gold's just metal. It's the pavement in heaven. The temple is where God dwells. The temple is what sanctifies the gold, just like the same thing. The altar is what sanctifies the sacrifice. 
And Jesus uses those examples. I'm, I'm sure a few of them were probably a common thing that they did. But Jesus calls them out on, on it, and he calls them out strongly. He calls them something that is a, is a very fitting little word picture. He says, you're blind guides. <laughs> now, I don't know if you've ever went on a tour, and if you, if you did go on a tour, did you have a blind tour guide? It's a very difficult thing to have a blind tour guide to guide you somewhere, but that's a great word picture because really they're fooling themselves by thinking they're getting away with swearing by the temple or the Lord or whatever and then not doing it. They think they're getting away with something. Jesus says, nope, they're just blind. And the, and the, and, and the, um, uh, the beatitude that goes with this, the, the fourth beatitude says, blessed are, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And here are these men who are hungering and thirsting for how to get away with stuff not for righteousness, not for justice. And so we see this parallel verse fitting pretty well there. Number five, the fifth woe, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. So once again, Jesus, he's, he's here, he's addressing this tithing ritual of the Pharisees. We talked about it a while back, that they would do this kind of tithing to the smallest thing. Usually they try to do it where people could see so that people would go, man, they they give everything of they have. They give a tenth of it to the Lord. I mean, even the salt. They're like, I'm going to take nine grains of salt for me, one for the Lord. And I don't know what they would do with it. They'd add it up someday and take it, give it to the temple, dust it off on the floor and say, that's for the Lord. I don't know. But they're doing this thing. It's a work that they're, that they're trying to do in order to be, really to be, come across as godly, to be honorable to the Lord. And what are they leaving out? Jesus says, you're leaving out the more important, the more heavy, the more weighty things. And that is to be just towards your fellow men. And that is to show mercy to people, to love people when they don't deserve it. And that's mercy. And to have faith. So, Really, one of the, what Jesus is showing us is that they are becoming unbalanced in their life of service to God. It became about a work, and it really became about a lesser work. It was almost like they would be like, look at me in this little busy work that didn't mean anything. But in the things that really meant something, they, they, they would, oh, I'm too busy counting my, my tithe of cumin to go help that person or to give of them some some assistance or whatever it was. And so... God is saying, you know, you're just not loving people. You're not doing the things. Or Jesus is saying that, that, that God would have you to do. And really, it reminds me of Micah chapter 6, verse 8, where it says, He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Man, when I think of these Pharisees and what they're doing in their heart, this was in their Bible. And they're missing it. And I guess I have to stop and say, Lord, help me not to miss those things that are just so evident, so clear. The way to be like you. Because here they are. And boy, are they missing it. And then he uses this illustration, this word picture, <laughs> It's really comical. It's awesome. Uh, uh, and he says, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. I don't know if you've swallowed a camel before. Swallowing a camel is very difficult. I recommend a big glass of water because they get stuck right there, right under your beard. <laughs> it's an impossible thing. And, and the funny thing is about this whole uh, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel is 
the gnat is the smallest unclean thing listed as far as the dietary law, and the camel is the largest unclean thing listed as the dietary law goes. And, and, and it's like Jesus is saying, look, what you're doing with this little stuff, this is what this looks like to God. It looks like you're, you're, you're all uh, obsessed with the things that's not even going to, if you swallowed that gnat, you'd be okay. And you're going to swallow a camel that's not okay. The big things, the important things, you're missing it. And one last note before we depart from this little section of text uh, here, and that's this. In the New Testament, there really isn't anywhere where it's, it's, it's recommended or made that we are supposed to tithe, give a 10% of our finances. Of course, we are to give, and that's, that's talked about throughout but not, not necessarily the tithe. And so we see something here that's interesting. Now, Paul does speak of giving, and he speaks when he speaks of giving, I think it's the, the time it's in 1 Corinthians, but check me on that, make sure I'm right. When he speaks of giving, he speaks of giving proportionately to what you earn. So he does speak of giving something, a percentage. He does speak of being a regular giver when we are to give. But there are people that say, well, we're not, we're not uh, you know, bound to tithe. We're not bound to give of a tithe. But here Jesus says something. I don't know if you caught it. It's pretty interesting. Jesus tells them they ought to have tithe without leaving the others undone. He said you ought to do those things, those weightier things, and what you're doing. Not overlook the, the one and just do the other. So Jesus in this little, you know, corrective section does tell us, he recommends us to tithe, to give a, a tenth of what, we, of what we make. So it's just an interesting little note, uh, take note of. Of course, we want to give from a cheerful, loving, grateful heart of gratitude for what God has given to us. Never go, rah, 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 give to the Lord, take all our money. He doesn't. <laughs> He doesn't. He's so gracious. He gives us every breath that we get. Amen. So anyways, when I think, when I hear about that, and I hear about their tithing to be seen by men of the spices of the mints, you know, the first thing I think of is, I wonder what their checkbook looked like. And I, and I know that's kind of, that might be, whoa, whoa, Isaac, don't be looking at my checkbook. Don't be looking at my checkbook. But if you, if you think about it, if they're ripping off widows, if they're ripping off elderly parents, if they're making money off of people who come to worship by, by you know, trading uh, the money changing and all that stuff. If they're doing these things and then tithing in these little mints and herbs, it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder what, what they're really doing, what's really going on. Because according to Jesus, it's not right. And the last time that Jesus talked about money, he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar, but you give to God what is God's. And that's where the whole thing starts. This giving starts. It's got to be given out of our heart. We have to give God what is his, and that's us. That's our heart. In order for our treasure to be where his treasure is and not be the things in this world. Okay, number six, verse 25. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but the inside are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside may be clean also. And Jesus goes into like this mode over the next last three woes, this one and the last two, um, and it's this concept that Jesus reveals to us with their deeds, with all the things that they did, that they are being hypocritical. They're worried about the outside. They're worried about what people think and see of them and not the inside, not what God can see, but what man sees. Jesus reminds them, God sees the inside of your cup and it's gross. And you're drinking out of it. I mean, like, that's the picture that he's painting with this cup. It's an, it's an awesome picture. It's a perfect picture. 
Because if somebody came and they gave you a glass of water and the outside was clean, but there was crusties that were floating up from the bottom because they were stuck to the bottom of the cup, you'd be like, no, no, this is, I got to get a different cup. This one's dirty inside. And because it's dirty inside, the whole thing's gross. You don't go, oh, it's okay if there's floaties in there. The outside's clean. And then drink. No. And that's the perfect picture that Jesus is saying, look, if the inside's dirty, the whole thing's dirty. The most important part is the inside. But if the inside is clean, then the outside can be clean. The outside will be really clean if the inside is clean. Verse 27. Oh, you know what? The beatitude for that one is, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Purity, clean, equals vision, equals seeing. All right, number seven, woe. Verse 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. All uncleanness, it says. Verse 28, even so, uh, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Man, is he calling these guys out. Now, he uses a picture. It's something they'd be very familiar with in that day and age, especially during the time that they're at, the time of the Feast of Passover, uh, which is right now in the context of the Bible, where we're at in our timeline. And the reason that they would be familiar with whitewashed tombs during this time, and you might be familiar with it, is that especially the tombs that were kind of hidden or you couldn't see, obscure, under a bush, whatever, they would get those tombs, the stones, and they would paint them with whitewash, with white paint, so that they were really easily spotted. Because if you touched one or sat on one or leaned on one or whatever, didn't know what it was, you'd be considered unclean and would not be able to partake of or celebrate the Passover. I mean, in my mind, I, I know he's up on the Temple Mount, but in my mind, he's like, whitewashed tombs. I'm going to reach over and point at one because they were just so common, and they probably just got painted. Even if there wasn't one right there, I'm sure that people, as soon as he said it, went, oh, I remember seeing that one right outside of town when we were walking in. Do you remember that? And he says, you're like this to the religious rulers. You're all clean on the outside. You look great. You look pretty. But inside is death. It's rotten. It's gross. Inside. Oof. What a, what a crazy, amazing picture that he paints. You appear to be clean on the outside, but inside you're full of uncleanness, hypocrisy, and lawlessness. Self-indulgence, he mentioned. They're full of themselves, full of sin. And the last woe here we'll go through, and we're just about done. We'll close up here in just a minute. The last woe, verse 29. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. So really quickly, before we move into the last section, what they're saying is shame on our elders, on our on our family, of the, the, the people of Israel before who killed the prophets. Jesus, he calls them out. He says, you guys go and you dress up their tombs. You, 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 you decorate them and, and, and honor them uh, by saying, we would have never killed the prophets of God. Well, what's the irony? They're about to kill the Son of God. Just like that um, parable of the vineyard and the vine keepers. They saw the servants coming and they killed them. And when the son come, they said, came, they said, let us kill him and take all will be ours. And so here's the irony of this whole thing. Verse 31, Jesus calls them out. He says, therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? 
Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of, the right, of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So he, he calls them out. He says, you guys think you're guiltless in all this. You're guilty. I'm going to send prophets. I'm going to send people to tell you, to testify of me. You're going to crucify them. You're going to scourge them. You're going to hunt them down from city to city. Again, when I think of that, I automatically think of uh, Saul. I think of the Apostle Paul. And, and he's going to do that, literally. Hunt them down. Kill some. Condone their murder. So he is going to do these things. And, and of course, Jesus says, you, you know, you're going to be a part of this. And, and how are you going to escape the condemnation? Verse 33, man, does he say some sharp words to these Pharisees. He says, serpents, brood of vipers. Okay, so he's calling them serpents, brood of vipers. And I just want you to think really quickly for a second who is that serpent of old? Satan, the devil. And so he's calling them the kids of Satan, really. You're, you're a brood. You're an offspring. You're a, you're a uh, you know, what is it? A snake nest full of baby Satans. This is what you guys are. How are you going to escape the condemnation of hell? Absolutely crazy. And I'll tell you how to escape the condemnation of hell. And I thought about this earlier when I went through the cleansing of the cup and the and the and and you know, or I'm sorry, the inside being dirty and the outside being clean and the whitewashed tombs full of bones. How do you make those things clean? How do you avoid the hell that we all deserve? Jesus is the escape. He's the answer. And the only way to be cleansed and washed on the inside is by the precious blood of Jesus that makes us whiter than the snow. The only way to, to, to move away from being a, a son of Satan, of the devil, is to become born again and become a son of God. And this is the direction that we, we know. Jesus is taking, but we know. We understand. We see the picture from our point of view, and we can see the whole thing clearly, what Jesus has done. He is the escape. And the end of this section, Jesus, he doesn't just leave it there. We really get to see the emotion. He's so emotional over everything that's going on. He just rebukes the, the ways of the Pharisees, the ways of the scribes. And then he goes on to show us that he's doing this in order that people would come to him. And he shares his heart over all the people. In verse 37, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Speaking directly of what he just said, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jesus cries out to all of these lost children of Israel. He cries out and, he, and he's, you know, we see, I think it's the gospel of Luke where it says that he, he wept. He's looking at the children of Israel. He's looking off the mount uh, the Temple Mount over Jerusalem and over all these people come together for Passover and his heart is broken because he wants them to come. He, his desire is that he would come. And what does it say there? That, that he'd be like a hen, that he would have his wing out and protect them. His desires, they would come and he would be their shelter and he would be their protection. He would be their salvation. But what does it say there? 
in verse 37, but they were not willing. I want to ask Caleb to come up. And I, and I want us to come to this place. I mean, one of the commentaries <laughs> that I went through, he said, I'm going to be a little, he, he called it provocative here. I'm going to say something. Jesus didn't say, I wish I could gather all of you, but you were not predestined. He did not say that. He said, you were not willing. You have the choice to come so that he could be your shelter, so that he could be your protection, so that he could be your calm in the storm, so that he could be your salvation, so that he could be, and he is, what we need in this life. He's our hope. He's our peace. He's our comfort. He's our, 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 our shelter in the storm. He's also our anchor in the waves. He's what holds us and keeps us. He's the best thing we've ever found. He's the best thing I've ever had in this life. And so I want to just give a call out, just like Jesus did, and say, he wants to be those things for you, but will you come to him? Let's come to him. Do it. Don't wait. Don't wait another day. Don't wait till tomorrow. Come to him now. Let him be what you need. Amen. Open the blind eyes, unlock the deaf ears, come to your people as we draw near. Hear us from heaven, touch our generation, we are your people, crying out in despair. we do come to you we are thankful to know you God I pray that this morning you would have revealed some of those areas in our hearts God so that we could come before you and say Lord I need to be washed on the inside I need to be cleansed I need to be made whole and so Jesus it's all open before you you see it all God, you see those shortcomings, you see those failures, you see those places where we're giving over to things that aren't of you. Lord, you, you see all of it. And so, God, I pray that we would come to you in sincerity, openly, and say, God, I need to be cleansed and washed and filled. I need to be just given to you. Stop keeping me for myself because it's a miserable life. Seeking to gain this world, we'll lose it. Seeking to gain this life, we'll lose it. But if we lose our life for your sake, we will find it. So thank you, Lord, for that truth. And God, as we surrender to you today, I pray that you would minister deeply in our hearts. God, we need you. We need to be filled by you. And so we offer our hearts to you, thanking you that you're so good, that you're so gentle and lowly, and that you know that way to give us rest in our soul. Oh, we thank you, God, for those times of refreshings that come with repentance. We give them to you. We give our lives, our hearts to you this morning. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys again. Happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. I'm so looking forward to seeing you next week. So we'll see you then. God bless you. Adios. Adios, amigos.